let's start this way. So the title, uh, Leave the Gun, Take the Cannoli, that jumps out at anybody who's ever seen The Godfather, which should be everyone. Was that your title from the from the get go? Well, it was one of the it was one of the best ones, of course, because it's one of the greatest ad libs of all time. You know, when uh, Clemenza, uh, after they shoot the turncoat polygato in the shadow of the Statue of Liberty, uh, says that immortal line, you know, and it was a total ad lib. And so it would just kind of represented the serendipity, the the unlikeliness, the the movie that everybody thought was not going to be a success. And just like that title, just like Clemenza's word, it, it, it words, it turned out to be one of the greatest of all time. You've been zeroing in on this. It's kind of been on your front burner for a long time. Is this sort of your great white whale? I mean, you've written other stuff, successful, great stories and books, uh, but is this the one? Well, you know, I think I'm I'm one of legions of Godfather fanatics, you know, all over the world. And I've always been obsessed with the movie since I wrote a story. Uh, well, I've been obsessed with the movie since I saw it as a college freshman in 1972. But in 2008, I was lucky enough to be assigned uh, by uh Vanity Fair magazine to write a story about the making of The Godfather. And so I was able to meet a lot of the players then and feed my obsession. Well, it's, you know, it's remarkable what separates your book from, as you said, and you write in your book, there's a lot that's been written about The Godfather, about Puzo and the making of the movie, but you had access. I mean, you got access to people who are now long gone. Exactly. Like the great, uh, the late, great Robert Evans, um, invited me into his home and uh, we watched parts of the movie together. Uh, so in his many, bed, in his bed, yes, right? Exactly, he, he, he watched movies in bed and he said, you know, let's go in there and we're gonna watch the movie. And so we laid on his bed and watched The Godfather, or at least parts of The Godfather, while he told me the story uh, of, uh, of the making of The Godfather. And so that was a, uh, a, a great afternoon. His screening room was out of order. And so from that point on, he and his friends watch movies in his bed. What a character. I mean, larger than life. I, you know, I haven't read his autobiography. I'm going to. Uh, it's one of those things that's on the list. But gosh, he, he could be a subject of a movie himself. Oh, my gosh. Yes, he was. He was the subject of that documentary, The Kid Stays in the Picture, that was based on his book. And you just, you know, he was the man who greenlit the movie, who, uh, you know, they hired the, the author, Mario Puzo, to write the screenplay before Francis Coppola came along. And then he fought uh, for every aspect of the movie as he writes, uh, you know, spending way too much time on The Godfather. But he always said, Robert Evans always said he wanted to touch magic which I think he did in this film. So much of what you chronicle here, it uh, comes to down to one word, is improbable. I mean, it's improbable that a lovable schlub like Mario Puzo would write such a massive and massively successful novel, that Paramount would produce it, that Evans would be in charge of production, that, that Coppola would get to direct it. All the cast members, as you chronicle, they're, you know, all of them, there were problems and barriers put up to any of this happening. It's, in, it's incredible it was ever made at all. It really is because they did Paramount did not want to make the picture in the beginning. Mob movies just did not play. They had made a film called The Brotherhood, which was critically fairly well received, but it bombed at the box office. So they weren't real keen on making the movie. But there was one thing, Mario Puzo's novel, The Godfather, was shooting up the bestseller list. And so they had to make it. Or Burt Lancaster wanted to buy the, the project from Paramount. And Danny Thomas wanted to buy the studio to, to, to buy the studio to make The Godfather himself and probably star in it. And uh, Paramount had to make the film at that point. Uh, talk to us about Mario Puzo. So you got to know him uh, doing all this research and the people around him. The fact that he never really actually met a real life mobster. Uh, I guess he did later. But yeah. growing up, uh, you know, you, you would think that as a degenerate or at least inveterate gambler like him would come across mob guys. But you say he didn't. Well, he always said he never met a genuine gangster, but he grew up around him all his life because he was a child of Hell's Kitchen. 
And, uh, you know, the, the mob uh, influence was there and he met men that were shadowy and, uh, but he never knew who they were and what they were doing. But, you know, one threw a, a blanket full of guns into their living room and asked his mother to, to keep them for, for him. So he's around these men and he knew their world. And he, he, he was a down and out writer. He had written two novels, both of which were critically well received, but commercially unsuccessful. I think he got $3,000 advance on each of them. And one of the, he, and he was trying to sell his third book. And, and the publisher said, one publisher said, if only there had been a little bit more of that mob stuff, he had a mobster in one of his books, maybe it'd be successful. And so he decided he wasn't going to write for art anymore. He was going to write for money. And I can tell you the story, the gutter story, if you'd like. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yep. So what the turning point in that Mario Puzo is the hero of this story. He was he came from uh, Hell's Kitchen and uh, he had a family of five that he was trying to support, but he had a gambling habit. He was low on money, was borrowing money right and left from family, bookmakers, uh, everyone else. And finally, one night, he had a severe gallbladder attack, and uh, he directed the taxi to take him to the VA hospital in New York. And as soon as he arrived at the hospital, the pain struck so bad, he opened the door, he fell out of the taxi and into a gutter. And he was laying on his back in the gutter, looking up at the night sky. And he said, as he later said, or later wrote, here I am, a published author, and I'm dying like a dog. And he said, it was that point where I decided I'm go going to be rich and famous. And he did. At that time, in that period, before the success of The Godfather, he's writing for these tawdry men's magazines, uh, and none of it would be considered art, but he really was banging out a lot of copy that honed his skills. He was the greatest Pulp Fiction writer, they said, of all time. He was writing for this collection of men's magazines, mostly. But he could create these amazing worlds uh, that he, everybody would take to be real. And that's where he learned his crap. He learned, he learned to write a story where all the main characters were introduced in the beginning. Just like the, in The Godfather, all the main characters are introduced in The Wedding. He also learned to write in a style that kept readers turning the pages. And he also included that he, he thought that because sex sells, he needed to have a lot of sex in, in his books and his articles. And he just became this great Pulp Fiction writer. And the Godfather novel has many of those traits. You, I, I, what comes across as you writing about him is that you like the guy. I mean, you, you admire him to some extent. He is kind of lovable, a big heart. Uh, he maybe isn't a degenerate gambler, but certainly gambling gets him into trouble, keeps him broke a lot. But, it, it, you know, he pays his debts. He, he There's a certain honor code with him, right? Well, you have to root for Mario Puzo. And I found myself rooting for him every step of the way. I was so lucky to uh, be able to look at his archives, which are at Dartmouth, Dartmouth University. And they have letters where he writes to the IRS, you know, I have a, a book, a book advance coming up and I'll be able to pay my taxes. Uh, you know, once that comes through, you can see his struggles. You can see he writes in this red pen, uh, felt pen, where you can see the notes, the outline, the characters, the godfather being born. And there he is, you know, this, this man, this author that everybody thought, as he said himself, he was the chooch of the family. You know, nobody expected him to amount to a lot. And here he is, he writes, he just creates this bestseller. You know, the Kefauver hearings, which stopped through Las Vegas, were captivating Americans in the 50s. It was the first time the mob was really exposed on national television. It was a sensation. And Mario Puzo was laying on his couch in uh, the suburb, suburbs of New York, watching along with everybody else. But what he did is he took this factual world and he created a world that was even more dramatic more violent not, maybe not as violent maybe not more violent but more gripping than any uh he, he created faction that uh, they, he created fiction that the world would take as fact he shopped it around no one was interested he finally uh go keeps working plugs away he calls his book the godfather which the publisher didn't like that title right that's right. That's what they didn't like. They hated the title, I was told. That's unbelievable. Uh, but he finally gets a rough draft and turns it in and he goes off the, to Europe for a vacation he can't afford and just <laughs> figures, well, you know, cast his fate to the winds, comes back. And what does he learn when he gets back? 
Yeah, so he goes on a vacation with his family to Europe because he promised his wife, who was born in Germany, that he would take her back. She hadn't been back since the war. And he takes his kids and they go over to Europe and he gambles at every casino on the Riviera and in London. And he's taking money off of his American Express credit cards and everything else. And he's broke. He's even more broke when he comes back. He calls his agent thinking she could pull a slick magazine story out of her hat like she had done to rescue him in the past. And she goes, you won't believe it. Uh, the book that you left us with, he had told them not to show the book to anybody because it needed to be po polished. Uh, we've just had an offer up for $400,000, which was then an advance, a record for an advance but from a paperback house. Suddenly, Mario Puzo was uh, rich beyond his wildest dreams. As you write in the book, he tries to tell his wife and other people, hey, I just got offered this 400 grand or 410 or whatever it was for this book. And, and it doesn't sink in, does it? Nobody believes him? Yeah, he had written about this in his own memoir. Uh, he, he said he called his mother and, and, she, and she misunderstood and she thought it was 40,000, which would have been great, you know, because he only got 3,000 for his last book. And so that would have been a, a, a world, you know, a windfall. And then uh, he had to say, no, mom, it was $410,000. <laughs> and he said he took the check to, to the bank to the teller that had always kind of like looked at him and, you know, kind of like in disparaging way because he was, you know, covered his checks and whatever. And he, all of a sudden he has 410,000 or whatever, a piece of that to, to uh, deposit. I think some of the best stories you write are about how he found inspiration and how he incorporated real life events into mobster lore. I mean, you mentioned about the bag of guns that was thrown in their apartment. That becomes a scene, I think, in, in Godfather 2, right? Yes. Yeah. So he he had been around all these these men all of his life. He knew their stories. He had watched the hearings. He was able to to take the any the other thing that Mario was great at was reading. He would just he was a, a voracious reader, and so he read about these men and their worlds, and he was able to create the secret to the godfather it's not just about criminals it's not just about gangsters it's about a family the family corleone and he was able to create this world with don corleone as francis coppola said he saw it not as a gang story of gangsters but the story of a king and his three sons and that's what puzo saw and that's what puzo created you, you write that a lot of the um, mannerisms or sayings came from his mom that, that later became part of don corleone's character Exactly. Yeah, he said a lot of the famous lines from from Don Corleone came from his mother's lips, like, you know, a man who doesn't spend time with his family can never be a real man. Uh, you, you know, the, many of the, the great classic lines from from the Don came from his mother, uh, who was a very, you know, tough uh, Italian American mom who, um, you know, just led her family uh, and, and created this incredible writer, Mario Puzo, the first writer ever to come out of the family. And you look what happened and look who he became. A lot of the research he did was here in my hometown, Las Vegas. Of course, it would be Mecca for somebody like Puzo, a, a inveterate gambler. He came here and I don't know if these are true stories. Do you believe them that he he learned, he, he conducted interviews at the roulette wheel and would pick up bits and pieces from pit bosses? That's what I was told. That's what I was told that he that he came to Las Vegas. Well, of course, we know he came to Las Vegas. His Las Vegas was he loved Las Vegas. He wrote a book about Las Vegas. He said, you know, his idea of heaven was a pit boss of the sky and, you know, a casino. He was a he loved to gamble and Las Vegas was home away from home. His assistant said that whenever, you know, they were heading to the studio, at some point, he would say, OK, get on the 405. And she knew what that meant. We're taking the first plane to Las Vegas. And he stayed at the Sands and the Flamingo, I believe. And I was told by um, by people in Las Vegas that he that he did learn uh, for, uh, about many of the, the characters that he modeled his family and, and, the, and the men that worked for the family after some real life people that uh that he that he learned about in las vegas he, he's at the sands as you write and he's peppering people with questions they're a little bit suspicious about him and what his motives are what he's up to but he does get some pretty good information i think carl cohen is one of his sources the guy who smashed out frank's <laughs> teeth uh, that's who, what i was told 
and and one of the lines that came from Cohen is, I made him an offer he can't refuse, right? Yeah, that's what I was told. I was told that uh, one night uh, there was uh, uh, someone disorderly in the casino, uh, Carl Cohen subdued him, and uh, somebody said, well, well, how did you do it? He goes, I made him an offer he couldn't refuse. <laughs> it was David Jansen, the actor. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Yes. So he picks up this these tidbits in Las Vegas, weaves them into the story. He was also asking about Sinatra. And he, of course, in the book, it is a very thinly veiled character in the book and the movie um, based on Sinatra. And Sinatra, as you write, was not happy about it at all. He met Puzo in a restaurant. Right. Exactly. He met they met in Chasen's, which was the Hollywood restaurant at those in those days. And and Puzo and Al Ruddy, the producer of The Godfather, went into Chasen's. And Puzo later wrote that Sinatra was standing there with John Wayne, and he did. He wasn't the down and out Sinatra that Johnny Fontaine was. This was a man who looked like looked like you know a million bucks, and he was standing there with John Wayne. And uh, Al Ruddy, the producer, said, you know, he knew that that Sinatra wasn't happy with the portrayal of Johnny Fontaine, even though he wasn't named Frank Sinatra, but it looked it looked a lot of similar traits. He said, let's take a wide turn. And so uh, they went to the other side of the restaurant and someone brought him over, Mar brought Mario over to meet Frank Sinatra thinking Sinatra would like it. And from that point on, there was fireworks in the restaurant almost led to, uh, there were threats of physical dot violence and it, it was a quite an explosive scene. So Sinatra hated the book. He certainly didn't want a movie to be made out of it. A lot of people didn't want it to become a, a movie after it was on the bestseller list forever. Um, but it, it got done as improbable as it was. And then later you write in the book that Sinatra changed his opinion, that he he made an offer that maybe he should be the godfather. Yeah, that was that was that's been told that uh, he went to the director, Francis Coughlin, and said, maybe you and I should do it myself. <laughs> and maybe he could play the Godfather. But who knows? As I write in the book, there's a million stories around the Godfather. Some of them are conflicting. Some of them, uh, you know, are, are a little bit strange. But, you know, that's what makes a great story about a, about the making of a movie, I think, is that so many uh, different stories about this movie. It has its own folklore. It has its own magic. It has its own momentum. And it's just uh, the the tale behind the movie is, I think, almost as almost as compelling as the movie itself. You hear conflicting stories about how mobsters reacted to the book. Yeah. In general, though, it sounds like they loved they loved the portrayal and their their mysterious world and men of honor. Oh yeah! After the after the book came out, at, really after the movie came out, Puzo uh, writes wrote in a in an old newspaper article I read that uh, the mob there was a, a rumor going around that he was paid a million dollars or something. You know, all the all these crazy stories uh, that the mob loved the the the, uh, the the movie so much that that they were behind it, which they obviously they weren't. Um, that um, that he um, you know, that he was, this is true, that he would go to restaurants and and the waiter would come over and say, uh, you know, a bottle of champagne would arrive or whatever and said it's a certain party's pleasure. Another, um, another member of one family told a New York Times writer that they loved the movie, that they felt that Puzo had to have some kind of in, inside information into their world, that he got them down too right. It was too perfect. But of course, he was he was a guy in a in a suburban New York basement with a typewriter and a dream, and he dreamed it all up. Yeah, Sammy the Bull Gravano, you quote him in the book yeah. saying that he must have had an inside source or something. Yeah. Even though, I mean, you, you can make an argument whether this is an accurate portrayal of the mob or not. It's sort yeah. of a glamorous, glamorous yeah. portrayal. Totally glamorous. Yeah, it's 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 a movie, you know. It's but it but it's a movie that that just has become myth, you know. It it, it is. It's a very glamorized uh, story, and it's a very glam. You know, the, even the wedding. I mean, I'm sure that uh, there's weddings like that with 750 pe you know people as extras, and they're you know throwing sandwiches and Clemenza's drinking wine from the bottle from the jug as Puzo wrote in his novel while he's blowing like a whale and you know Johnny Fontaine or comes in and ser serenades the crowd I mean it's just over the top uh glamour you're right it's just very glamorous portrayal of the of maybe what's not such a glamorous world 
and although the mobsters seem to like the book and that portrayal, when the movie gets going, there are a lot of problems, a lot of threats, yeah. very right. serious threats, right? Yes, because in those days, in the early 70s, well, the studio, uh, you know, first they wanted to film in Kansas City or St. Louis because New York was the most expensive town to film in. And they wanted to make it current day because period is also very expensive. But Coppola insisted on New York. And once they got to New York, even before they got to New York, they went head to head with the mob. And first Al Ruddy's car was shot up in Beverly Hills. And there was a note on the windshield saying, you know, they didn't want the movie made. Then there was something called the Italian American Civil Rights League in New York that was headed by a gentleman named Joe Colombo. And he was fighting for what he saw against what he saw as stereotyping of Italian Americans in popular culture. And the Godfather became quite a quite a target that they wanted to stop in the beginning. Uh, but and the, the, what happened was the permits were um, not able to be, be, you know, permits didn't happen, locations didn't come through, uh, people, truck drivers were threatening not to, to work on the film until Al Ruddy met with uh, the leaders of the league, Joe Colombo and his associates, and what they wanted was one word to be taken out, taken out of the script, and that was mafia, which they did. And uh, it was a simple excision for a world of cooperation, and pretty soon the door is open to the uh, movie, and uh, and the rest is history. And of course, the supreme irony there is Joe Colombo really was a mobster. He was a mob boss who was heading this organization to pro protest the unfair stereotyping of Italians as mobsters. But he was a mobster, wasn't he? He was. He was one of the another incredible character uh, in this whole in this whole story. And actually he was, uh, you know, when the movie was act was filming in New York, they were filming a scene at the St. Regis and uh, Joe Colombo was having, uh, leading a rally in Columbus Circle. And he, he was shot, uh, shot down by a, a would-be assassin. He lived for seven years, but, uh, you know, and Coppola had said, you know, it was like, you know, life imitating art, just as art had imitated life. And he couldn't, he, he thought, it. you know, he said, I can't believe these people go around shooting any like this anymore. We thought that those days were over, but indeed it was not. The, uh, you write in, in great detail about the battles for, to cast the movie and who was going to be in what role. And Francis Coppola had his own ideas right from the get go, but suddenly you got all these real life mob guys uh, offering to to sign up and some of them sort of leaning on it and and threatening that they'd better get in the picture, right? <laughs> yeah, everybody wanted to be in the movie after that point. Um, you know, as I said before, with 750 extras at that wedding, you know, you can count on some some people getting in. Uh, I was also able to, to interview the, uh, the New York casting um, the director who cast the extras. And he told tales of like getting a, a scene out of Puzo's novel. He said there was a fish rat that was delivered to him, uh, you know, from someone interested in the role and uh, other stories like that. And so, yeah, everyone wanted to be in that movie. I mean, but Coppola, Francis Coppola, the director saw the, his cast from the very beginning. He saw uh, Al Pacino as Michael, he saw Sonny, uh, being played by James Caan, uh, and he saw, you know, Tom Hagen uh, being played by Robert Duvall, and uh, he saw Diane Keaton as Kay Adams, but, uh, and he brought them all to New York, to San Francisco, where he was living, he brought them all to San Francisco, where he was living, his wife gave them haircuts, and he did a homemade screen test, and you can see those online, but uh, the studio had different um, ideas on who would play who. Robert Evans had different ideas. And so they went through hugely expensive uh, and intensive screen tests of almost every actor in town, uh, only to end up with the cast that Coppola envisioned from the start.
the names that are thrown around. I'm, I'm putting them in, in the movie version that's playing on my head. And I just can't imagine it being the same. I mean, Robert Redford was mentioned for the Michael Corleone part, right? Exactly. Robert Redford was one. Ryan O'Neill, uh, who was in Love Story for Paramount, which was a huge hit for Paramount, was considered as Michael. But the big, 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 big uh, battle was over Marlon Brando. Nobody wanted Marlon Brando except for Puzo at first. Puzo wrote to Marlon Brando. Uh, he wrote a letter in his distinctive hand. And at the top, he put his current address that said, North Carolina Fat Farm, where he was <laughs> reducing. And he wrote, Dear Mr. Brando, you're the only actor who could play the Godfather uh, with the quiet intensity the role requires. And Coppola felt the same way that Brando was, was born for this role. But Brando was 47. And he was considered washed up in the industry. He was considered problematic on the set and nobody wanted Brand Brando and they had to really fight to get Marlon Brando. You write about this incredible scene where Brando transforms himself into Don Corleone. And at that moment, it alleviated all concerns about whether he's right for the movie. Exactly. Yeah. So they, uh, you know, uh, the head of Paramount said, you know, okay, we'll consider it. Finally, we'll consider Brando, but he has to, to agree to certain terms, including do a screen test. And though Brando would never have done a screen test, but Coppola called it a makeup test. We're just gonna come up to your house and fool around. <laughs> and so they arrive one morning, uh, Coppola, uh, a cinematographer named Hiro Narita and a few assistants. And Brando walks out, he's got a ponytail, he's wearing a kimono. And this is the classic tale of the Godfather that he pulls back his uh, ponytail, he puts some shoe polish on his upper lip, he stuck some Kleenex in his cheek, says, I wanna talk like a bulldog. And before their rolling cameras becomes the Godfather in such a dramatic fashion that they, they're, you know, they can't believe it. They were stunned into silence on the way back. Coppola goes directly from uh, Los Angeles to uh, Charlie Bluedorn, who owned the studio, Gulp and, he, his company Gulp and Rester, known Paramount, and he took the film footage to Bluedorn and showed it to him in his office, and he goes, he couldn't believe it, and everybody was just as stunned, and that footage uh, won Brando the role, and then that footage disappeared from the face of the earth. Uh, nobody knows where it is to this day. Uh, you know, I always think of it like Hemingway's letters on this train station in Paris, you know, that were lost, not his letter, but Hemingway's uh, first stories that were lost in the Gare de Lyon, the train station in Paris. It's just a lost artifact that would be so amazing to see. I've seen the movie probably 40 times, I guess. It's magnificent. I mean, it, if I have a, it doesn't matter what my list of best movies are, but it's certainly at the top. And it, it's hard to to say uh, Godfather Two, where that is on the list, but they're just uh, such a great, such a great project, and has stood the test of time. And um, I wonder how does Co Coppola, Francis Coppola, feel about it today, looking back at it now? What well, a moment I, it was! Yeah, you know, he didn't think it was after he had so many wars and battles, and you know, as I write, is discuss in the book, it was just a battle for him from day one. And uh, Peter Bart, who was uh, Robert Evans's right-hand man at, at Paramount during those days wrote that it was like all these tensions came together. It was like, you know, the war of the Corleone's versus nothing compared, compared to the war of the men and women who made the Godfather. Because at every moment they thought that Francis Coppola thought he was gonna be fired. Al Pacino thought he was gonna be fired. Uh, there was an insurrection among uh, the crew uh, who worked for Coppola. Uh, Coppola and his uh, film uh, cinematographer uh, had differing opinions at some point. Um, and so Coppola left the set, which was hellish, and went to Paris where he was writing uh, the screenplay for The Great Gatsby, again for Paramount. And he didn't know it was a success, he would later say, until his wife called him. Uh, and she goes, he, he was in a hotel and she goes, you won't believe it, Francis. It's a phenomenon. <laughs> and he uh, only then, you know, discovered it was such a huge success. So, you know, it was a great achievement and it was, it announced him as one of the great directors of, uh, of American and international cinema. 
Paramount, which was, as you write, it was really on the skids on, on thin ice. It needed a miracle. This movie gave it to them. They got, did I get this right? $12,500 is what Puzo sold the movie rights for? That, yeah, that's, what he, that's what's been said. Of course, as I write in the book, Robert Evans said that Puzo came to him with his pages tucked under his arm and Evans said, uh, in trouble, he goes, Han how? He needed some cash for, you know, his, uh, <laughs> the, the, the bookies or whoever he owed money to, he said. This is Evans's portrayal. So we don't know exactly if it's true or not. And he says, okay, I'll give you 10, 10 grand. He goes, well, can you make it 15? And Evans says, what about 12, five? <laughs> and uh, so that was Evans's take. But then Peter Bart later said that the pages came to him, not Evans. Other people said they saw it first. So it's just one of those uh, crazy stories that has a, a different, uh, different viewpoints from different people. What's the line you use in the book about, uh, you know, success has many fathers? Um, in this case, it's many godfathers. I guess a lot of people take credit for the for the movie being such a phenomenal hit. Exactly. So, uh, something like success has as many fathers as godfathers or something <laughs> like that. Yeah. Every you know, of course, I mean, so many people worked on this movie and so many people added to its magic. I mean, you know, the horse headed scene with John Marley, uh, you know, the, the Luca Brasi scene that was done by then a first time actor who was actually a professional wrestler. Uh, you know, he just, it was so majestic as Luca Brasi, Lenny Montana was his name. Uh, you know, Fredo, uh, the third, the son who uh, was, was, you know, just magical. He had never been in a big film at that point. Uh, John Cazal, who would go on to Oscar nominations and so much glory and fame. I mean, all of these unlikely pieces came together in this masterpiece. And it's just, it, it's just amazing that it even happened. And who knows if it could happen again. It's just one of those movie stories that are just, you know, they created this piece of magic that will live forever. Uh, James Caan was not Italian, but he had grown up in the, I think, Queens, and the, he yes. knew mob guys. He got to know them even more during the making of the movie. Uh, he was perfect for Sonny, don't you think? Oh, he was so great. Uh, he 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 knew these people. He, he was from Queens. He'd been around them all of his life. He said he grew up in a neighborhood where <laughs> there were not that many actors or artists, but there were a lot of thieves. And uh, he said that he bought uh, these. W one thing that he did say, he was stuck on a scene and he just felt that he wasn't, you know, into it. And then he thought of, you know, Las Vegas is one of Las Vegas's great comedians, Don Rickles. And he thought, um, you know, he remembered Rickles and how Rickles would just, you know, it's, you know, say things immediately in, in this explosive way. And that's how he, he informed the character of Sonny. And you can see that in the script, um, in his performance. Also, he went to a next to new shop, I think he said, and he bought these tight shoes. Uh, they were like too tight for him, two tone shoes. And that's how he, he uh, you know, facilitated Tony's kind of, I mean, uh, Phil said he facilitated Sonny's walk and that gate, you know, where he's walking around and strutting around. So he really used uh, real life people that he knew to create this iconic role. One of the other actors that you write about was a, it was his first role is Gianni Russo, who's a Las Vegas yeah. character of considerable renown. And I, I've met him, you know, 30 years ago, he had a nightclub here, shot a couple of people. I remember him being on our news set and pulling a gun out of his holster and putting it on the desk. And, uh, but he lobbied for the, the role uh, of Carlo and he made his own film, right? He made his own little sort of a, a yeah. yeah, video. Yeah, he made his own audition film. Yeah, Gianni Russo, uh, I don't believe he had appeared. He had a, he had a Las Vegas show though. Welcome to my uh, lifestyle, right? At yeah. a nightclub, Johnny Russo's State Street uh, Club, I believe. I'm, that may have been after The Godfather, but I don't believe he had been in a motion picture as an actor. And wow, he was so great. And he, uh, you know, he created this tape where he played all three roles, and he had it delivered to Al Ruddy in Los Angeles. And, uh, but, you know, as I write in the book, nobody was quite sold on him until he convinced everyone that he was right for the role. He, uh, I think he, it was the scene where he, he, in one of those violent scenes with Connie Corleone that he acted out. 
in one of the Paramount offices, and uh, he was pretty convincing in the role. Yeah, he's, I mean, he grew up, he knew those mob guys. The last time I talked to him, I told you in an email, he was calling from the apartment that was owned by Frank Costello. He says Frank Costello, the mob boss, gave it to him. I don't know if wow. you know if that's true. Wow, that's incredible. And then you write about um, the, the cast really bonded, that Brando, far from being divisive and temperamental, sort of bonded with Duvall and Khan, and they all kind of hung together. Yeah. Yeah, the great story is that Coppola had the, you know, the genius to uh, bring the cast together as a family over an Italian dinner at Patsy's uh, Italian American restaurant in New York. And Brando headed the table and Talia Shire uh, as Connie was helping with with serving and uh, and, uh, you know, Khan was there. Uh, Al Pacino, I believe, was there. Uh, everyone was there. It was like a, they, from that point on, the characters existed, Coppola later wrote, because he brought them together as a family and they felt like a family. They looked up to Brando. They, um, they did everything together. And as you can write, some of the hijinks that happened on the set uh, were quite, quite hilarious. And, you know, Brando was just, you know, charismatic and everyone loved him, it seemed. Yeah, the, the scene that's now in my head permanently is Brando mooning the rest of the cast are at the wedding scene, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, they said they said that they had a, a moon contest. Uh, I think your 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 viewers will, will know what mooning is. <laughs> uh, so I don't have to explain it that, uh, you know, they were on after their first rehearsal, they were on one of the main streets of New York and someone mooned Brando. It, it, was, it was either Khan or uh, Hay or uh, Robert uh -huh. Duvall and uh, and uh, Brando. Uh, then they later had a moon contest, and Brando moon the, ca the cast at the wedding or something. That's what that's what's been written. I don't know if, how much of that is true. I Mark believe Seale, it's, all it's a great book filled with great stories. Wonderful detail. Leave the gun, take the cannoli. I recommend it to everybody. Thanks very much for joining us. Thank you so much, George. It's great being here. And I'll talk to you again soon. A couple of weeks.